So we will discuss, as there is, uh, as we have been uh, posted also uh, on the net, how a possible roadmap for the um, for a strategy to innovate out of the crisis. What we have learned mm -hmm. at the policy level, but also at the business level, from all these. Uh, crisis that uh, um, we have um, witnessed, the role of uh, technological infrastructures and platforms, the role of university industry relationships and the mechanisms, the actions and the tools that we have at hand in order to enhance this new growth model. And also we will see some of the case studies that might be uh, of some importance to see exactly cases how this collaboration between universities and, and um, businesses um, is working. Now, we have uh, representatives from um, six uh, groups. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Kimon Danielidi, who is the general manager of LKME, which is the Hellenic Research Center for Metals. It is a part of the Viohalco group. We have uh, Mr. Uh, Spiros Kargis, manager of new technologies and alternative, uh, alternative energy sources from the Hellenic Petroleum, which is one of the biggest oil refineries in Greece. We have uh, Mr. Marius Karciotis, Group Research and Innovation Manager from Titan Cement Company. We have Mrs. Mariana Rally, which is in Scientific Affairs uh, from the Cores Natural Product, which is a business, cosmetics uh, business. Um, we have um, Mrs. Vaso Dimitriou for the Federation of Hellenic Food Industries. Food uh, processing and food manufacturing is one of the biggest sector, manufacturing sectors in, in Greece. And we have Mrs. Maria Bura from Ericsson Elas. It's a multinational that it is uh, um, the, the local branch here. And they will, we will start actually with uh, Mrs. Bura that uh, she will give us, let's say, the technological environment, the future, a glimpse of the future that we have in front of us then that could shape also business models and, and business activities. So uh, with this uh, context, I would like the, the format of, of the discussion goes like this. Uh, each one of the representatives will do a short uh, uh, presentation uh, on, on the topic that, uh, in the context that I have uh, set. And then we can have an open discussion both on, uh, on the floor and then also with uh, the audience taking uh, questions from our uh, um, par conference participants. So I would like then to, to to call uh, Mrs. Bure to start, okay, with a, with a technological, let's say, environment. Huh? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for staying that late to listen to us. I will try to make it exciting and fast. <laughs> Uh, so what I will try to do, I will try to lay the foundation for our discussion afterwards, talking about innovation in the era of the fourth industrial revolution. The truth is that we are living in extremely exciting times right now. We are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution and the, the pace of change has been accelerating and yet we're not there. It's going to accelerate even more. Just to give you an example, it took us about a hundred years to connect one billion places around the, the globe by fixed telephony, fixed communications. It took us just 25 years, so one fourth of the time, to connect five billion, so five times more people around the globe with mobile communications. And now we believe that by 2022, so in just 15 years, so even less time, we're going to have 29 billion connected devices around us. So, the truth is, as I said, that the changes that are happening right now, humanity has never experienced such a quick rate pace of change. Yet it is going to be slow as compared in some years in front. Augmented reality, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles are going to become the norm very, very soon. So scientists see that each industrial revolution has two phases, the installation phase and the transformation phase. Right now, we are in the middle of having started the transformation phase journey of the fourth industrial re revolution, which is underpinned, catalyzed, and enabled by information and communications technology. Namely, mobility and broadband, IoT and the cloud are the underlying technologies that are helping us to go that way. And the distinct, two distinct phases have two different approaches because in the installation phase of any new technology in the human history, what is happening is that you focus on what you're already making to do it in a more efficient way, cost efficient, 
uh, um, resource efficient, and so on. So there is a vertical industry logic and a narrow impact overall on the human activities. However, once you pass the threshold and you go to the transformation phase, and this is where we are today, you get very much more innovation focused. A lot of disruption is happening in the old world. Everything is happening, everything is changing across business and society, and there is an extensive impact in all human activities, not just the economy. And this is exactly where we are today. If you want a paradigm from the past, think about electricity. When it was invented, it was used, it was intentionally used, the intention was to have it for lighting, right? At night time to be able to have light in the house. Who from these times would ever have imagined that we would have refrigerators and TV sets and washing machines and you name it, that works on electricity today? No one. If you would say something like that to them at that time, they would think you're crazy, right? And this is also a characteristic of when transformation happens, you don't know where it will take you. And I will come back to that in a moment. So the fourth industrial revolution is the one that ICT is transforming all industries. And it's transforming industries and all human activity, not in just one way. It's a multifaceted transformation. That's why it's very much disruptive. That's why it's very much linked to innovation. So the production is being, is being um, uh, influenced because for impacted. For example, think about 3D printing and the possibilities that you get with 3D printing, both for individualized production, but also different type of production. Distribution chains are going to change. Organizations need to change to digitalize. Business models are becoming completely different. We talk about services rather than physical products. Think about the example of Uber, a very typical example. Uber does not own a single taxi, right? Yet they're making in one year more revenues in San Francisco than all the taxi companies together. And they don't own a single resource. A completely new business model, completely disruptive for the industry they targeted, being able, being available because of the ICT and the transformation. And consumption logic is changing. We're moving from uh, use specific to the sharing economy and industry structure. So everything is being changing and transforming. And we're going to see even more transformation and disruption as we go forward. And that's where you, innovation comes up as a, as, a, as a must be state, as something that really will help us take that forward and use it for the good of humanity at the end of the day. So if I go a bit more deeper on the technology, but just a little bit, I will not bore you with that. 5G is a basic technology that we are going to be using in a few years from now, in three or four years from now, uh, towards that direction. And why is that? Very simple. The networks that we are using today for communication, they were not built for such traffic. Traffic is going to be eight times the traffic of today in just four years' time. Video is today 50% of the total data traffic is going to be 75%. Networks were primarily that we're using today, even the 4G networks, they were primarily made for transferring voice. And of course they evolved to transfer also data. So 5G should be seen as the network of networks, the utopia of the engineers, a network that is intelligent enough, flexible enough, adaptable enough, software defined, that it can allocate network resources, like as if it is creating a complete network, a network slice as we call it, from end to end, to serve the specific use case that we call it to serve with a specific quality that is required, if it is critical or massive or whatever, low latency, high throughput, if it is an operation or remote operation by a doctor, or if it is an autonomous vehicle that needs to stop in just one meter not to hit the person on the road, or if it is a smart meter somewhere in the desert in Australia. So it has to have the capability to adapt to things that we don't know today, because the fact is we do not know what kind of use cases are going to come out today. So the design of this network has been made with this in mind, and it is going to use all existing networks, fixed and mobile, but also new technology. So why I want to show this? This I want to show because, as I said, because we are in the face of transformation right now, because a lot of disruption in innovation is happening, no one has all the answers. As I said before, think about the electricity paradigm. We don't know today, in five or 10 years or 20 years from now, what will be the winning application? What will be the services and the applications we need to use, both in the economy and as humans in our everyday life, working, living, entertaining, educating ourselves, health, and so on. 
So if no one has the answers, the answer is we need to collaborate. We need to explore together what can this new technology be used for in order to be useful and valuable to us humans and to the industry and to the economy, of course, right? There is an economical, uh, financial aspect always. So we are collaborating with 33 operators worldwide, 20 industry partners and 45 university, university and research academic institutions in order to explore different industries to see how this new technology can be best be used and put at the service of the human, and also, of course, create, generate new value, right? I, I, um, open new markets, uh, create new businesses, and so on. And just to give you an idea of what I want to say, for example, in the mining industry, we went into the mining industry with the intention just to uh, build a network that is robust enough to cover underground uh, facilities of this, of this uh, mining industry, of, of mines, let's say. But once we got in there, we saw, we realized that, for example, in Sweden, which is a small country but has a lot of mines, 2% of the total energy consumption in the country goes for air ventilation in mines. If you have a communication system robust enough that you can trust at any time with high reliability and can regulate automatically the air ventilation in mines so that you don't spend overdue it when you don't have any people there, right? You can gain a lot of money and you can do good to the environment. This was a need that they did not know that could be covered with our technology, but we found out together. And that's why it's very important, this collaboration between the industry, uh, the, the, the ICT vendors and so on, and the research institutions. And that's just one example. So there is, as I said, a financial value to it as well. And we as Ericsson have worked with Arthur D. Little. This is the first study of its kind. And we try to, to identify, to find out how much money would be there to be made as revenues or investments from the part of the industries for digitalization in the globe. The amount is 3.2 trillion USD in 2026 and how much of this would be attributable to 5G enabled digitalization revenues. And the number is, is 1.2 globally. But I want to give also the local dimension. This is the first study that we know that we don't know anybody else who has done a similar study. And you can see how these revenues are distributed on a per sector basis. And we have translated that also to the Greek environment because we are here today, we're talking about Greece. As Angelo said, we need to find ways to get out of the crisis. And 5G could very well be one of these opportunities because it's early still. No one has still the lead. So this is the same picture for, for Greece. And we see that there is a 3.9 billion USD potential for 2026 to be made from 5G enabled digitalization uh, in the various industries. And the, the most uh, important leaders that are going to be benefit from those are going to be energy and utilities, according to our estimations, manufacturing and public safety, followed by the rest of the industries, industrial sectors. So to end this up, because I don't want to eat too much of, of our time, I just put an example of this, of the 5G for Sweden, and we could do something similar for Greece, for example, which is based on innovation, is based in collaboration. The message is in this new environment where everything is changing by using technology in completely new ways, the only way forward could be to collaborate, to collaborate early and come together the industry, the research and academic institutions, the state, wherever is needed, and together explore new business value, new business models, new opportunities, and new uh, processes and new services that would be useful and create value for all of us. And with this, I think I've, I'm done. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Bura, for giving us uh, a glimpse of the future, actually, of uh, the infrastructures and the challenges and the opportunities that we face uh, and, and all the companies around the globe, uh, not only the local uh, companies, and how things are evolving. And uh, it's a globalized environment, global environment, um, uh, and uh, you see how uh, technology can um, create opportunities for everyone. I, I would like to give the floor now to Mr. Karciotis. Huh? from the Titan Cement Company. Um, a Greek multinational, I would say. Exactly. So good afternoon, everyone. And 
First of all, I'd like to start by saying thank you for having us here. A big thanks to Professor Kalogiru and Professor Tsakanikas for this wonderful opportunity to actually learn more about Globalix. It's a very interesting and highly uh, motivating and mobile network. So I'll very briefly talk about Titan Cement, who we are and what we do especially, specifically on R&D. As I think Mr. Tsakanikas has said, we are one of the few remaining Greek multinational, along of course with uh, Biohalco and other companies. Uh, we're based in Greece, but we're uh, active globally. There's uh, 14 cement plants, one of them uh, uh, recently bought in uh, Brazil, and our uh, portfolio covers building materials, first and most of all, cement production, then concrete and other materials. We rely on international collaborations to uh, perform our development and research activities. We were the first, uh, and also our CSR activities, we're the first Greek company to sign the United Nations Global Compact. We're a member, uh, a core member of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We're a member of the European Alliance for CSR and also the European Pact Youth, where we're also uh, participating. We're members and partners in two of the major European cement research uh, bodies. This is the ECRA, which stands for the European Cement Research Academy, and NanoSEM, which is the foremost uh, research entity on basic science for cement and concrete. Uh, as you can see here, where uh, our plants are located, we are active in, first of, first of all, in Greece, where the company started in, in 1902, then uh, US, Southeastern Europe, and Middle East. I very briefly will go over a few of the technical aspects of cement because I want also to uh, highlight uh, what we do and why we do it. So cement is made up by actually uh, calcining raw materials that we get from the, from the ground, rocks and minerals that we burn into high temperature in order to produce the cement. And cement is a material that we all know and trust. This is where we live in and where we perform our daily activities. Uh, of course, there is one uh, significant drawback, and that is the CO2 emissions associated with cement. We're not the most, let's say, uh, carbon emitting, the highest carbon emitting company in terms of amount of CO2, but because of the amount of cement that is required globally, we do uh, emit quite a lot of CO2. And as you can see, the production and the demand for cement uh, doesn't seem to be going you know, down anytime soon. So we, the people of the world, we're still gonna be needing, we're gonna be using cement to build our homes and our offices. So we have to find a solution, and this is our top most priority, to bring down our carbon footprint. So in addition to being a highly competitive market that is changing rapidly, uh, sustainability is the main driver across the sector. And as you can see on the graph here, on the allocation of CO2 throughout different sectors, cement accounts for 5% of global CO2 emissions. So the, the industry as a whole is working very intensively on that, on how to improve our carbon footprint and make responsible use of raw materials and fuels. In addition to that, also mentioned earlier, we have new technologies, disruptive technologies, the major of which is probably digital revolution, the industrial internet of things, which will change things very, very quickly and very soon. And of course, this was also mentioned, 3D printing. In a few years, we might actually build our house, we might actually start printing them. And this is also a new take. And we also consider the fact that the abundance of electrification will be uh, a reality, and that will make things for us quite easier, quite actually more uh, possibly greener. I would go very quickly on the CO2 reduction strategy. Uh, we as a European-based company, uh, we're involved on modifying our, our production and our operations in order to reach the so-called the low carbon economy for Europe. So very briefly, there's, there seems to be two strategies. One of them involves carbon capture and utilization. One of them does not. It's very early to say which one of them will be the, the case. Uh, Titan, we're taking actions in both scenarios uh, in order to find the solution that will work best. So if I would, to sum, if I would be to summarize our R&D outlook, it would be uh, uh, 
uh, based on these uh, five, let's say, pillars, which is the sustainable growth, the embracing of, of new technologies, improving our products, promoting the cycle economy, and of course, this is all done by expanding our knowledge base. And in that, I present our research arm, which is the Research Development Quality Department. You can see here what our uh, main focus areas and uh, how we operate. Uh, we also are active in uh, European and international research projects, and most of them at the moment are focused on the CO2 circular economy. And just to wrap up, very, I hope I made the best use of our time, is uh, I want to say that for us, the collaboration with academia is essential. The universities, the research center, centers are an essential partner in order for us to uh, develop, to grow, to find talents and save new ideas. Uh, from academia, we find many times the solutions, we find the knowledge. Uh, most importantly, what we find is the imagination. It's the imag imagining the new ideas and shaping the future for all of us. With that, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Karciotis. There are various questions that I want to make after uh, taking stock of your experience uh, in all these activities. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to uh, Mr. Danilidis from LKME. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks also, Mr. Kalogir and Mr. Kanikas, for inviting us here in this very interesting conference. Uh, I'll make it short to you so that uh, we leave some time for discussion, which I think is essential uh, in order to maybe, with our opinions and uh, contributions, assist change the environment and the situation in the post-crisis era in Greece. Um, I'm representing uh, Viohalco and actually LKME, which is the R&D arm uh, of the Viohalco group. Viohalco uh, is, um, is an, also an old company, eight years old, which is actually leading a leading metal processing company across Europe and also around the world. As you see, uh, some, some um, figures here, uh, like our turnover and the investments that have been made in the, last, uh, in the last years. And we are actually one of the most diverse metal industry around the world, and being active in uh, all three metals, steel, aluminum, and copper. As you see, we have offices and plants around the world, and uh, we support the, uh, the metal industry and other industries uh, in various uh, sectors. You, we, we are sure that you're using at home or uh, at any time uh, products which are indirectly or directly products of, uh, of our companies like the beverage cans were from, that you're using for Coca-Cola, for beers or whatever, or the cars that you're driving, they have some parts which are manufactured from our products. So very quickly, as I told you, we are very uh, highly diversified, being, um, <clears throat> being active through our products in the building and construction, in energy and power networks, in transportation and industrial application and other markets. And uh, this is why we, you can find everywhere and anywhere products from, from, from our group. So I'll, uh, I'll tell you now very quickly what we're doing at El Keme. And um, we have some, some laboratories. We are in the process physical metallurgy and form metallography. We have uh, the mechanical, mechanical testing, surface science and coatings, environmental and recycling, corrosion, analytical chemistry, and numerical modeling, and all these departments actually assist the development of new products, of the improvement of existing products. Um, some of our key activities, as you understand, are in the alloys and process development and uh, optimization. We do industrial trials. We do simulations, microstructure characterization, failure analysis, and, and, and so forth. 
The major point is that we, we want to provide value-added R&D services and provide technical solutions for, for our uh, companies. So now I will um, take a few minutes to explain to you, and this is the, the major uh, part of my present, short presentation, how we do it, how we do that. Uh, this is a mechanism, and um, this is how it works. We believe that it is uh, an extraordinary time for innovation. The, technolog the technological change and industry disruption seem to be accelerating, as it was shown in, a, in the previous presentation. Digital, transform, uh, digital information networks are linking individuals, organizations, and nations as never before. Even as opportunities grow, <coughs> grow to exchange ideas and cross-fertilize innovative impulses across organizational boundaries, we're also seeing a, a renaissance of something what we believe is the um, renaissance of the traditional and corporate R&D departments. And uh, in order to make it work, we all need mechanism and the culture that encourage the embrace of new technologies, kindle the passion for knowledge, and ease the barriers to creativity. So this is a simplified schematic showing the cross-functional cross-functioning of the enablers that you see on the left, which are contributing or affecting directly or directly the, the so-called ingredient that we call, which actually generate the driving force for actually coming to new products and optimizing the existing. And then, of course, finally, this is uh, this becoming the, the driving force for the company progress. As you see, customer-driven approach and global markets. What is important is to listen carefully to customer, to customer current and potential and their requirements from worldwide, worldwide so that we can explore and efficient, efficiently cope with the future challenges and so grasp faster and actually proactively the business of opportunities. Then innovation, and, innovation culture and creativity. Actually, innovative cultures start with a philosophy and a tone. They need to, they, they, you need to make people understand the accountability, the accountability for the company's objectives, the key focus areas, the core capabilities, and commitments that we have to the stakeholders. But they need, they need also the scientists, they need discretion to conduct their work uh, so that to service these parameters. Too much focus on budget and deadlines, that kills ideas before they get off the ground. So we try to keep that aside as much as possible. Actually, once the scientists realize that they are ultimately accountable for delivering practical products and processes that can be manufactured affordably, then you can trust them. You can trust them that they do not embarrass you by wasting your money and your time as a company. And this trust helps to forge the innovation culture. Flexibility for change and continuous improvement. This is, uh, this is achieved through the management encouragement, the empowerment, and the support. And we do, we do that by fostering learning, mentoring, and training people and setting, though, also relevant performance KPIs. Then we have the smart use of resources. We establish and promote knowledge networks, cross-disciplinary cooperation utilization of existing expertise, transfer of technology across business units. Actually, the production, pres <coughs> preservation, and diffusion of knowledge have become a top priority and is of vital 
important. Therefore, we need the access to knowledge pools and the use of modern technology. We make use of transfer vehicles, specific transfer vehicles, we call them transfer vehicles, for sharing the scientific information and knowledge and diffusing any research results, find new challenge of knowledge transmission across our companies. And then finally, which is really essential, is the collaboration with the academia. Relationship that extend beyond the boundaries of organization are invaluable to, occur, to actually to acquiring and, and distributing knowledge. These relationships have uh, indeed in the past produced leads also to emerging technologies, which are vital for being at the forefront of the, of, of the new challenges. We focus on close collaboration between uh, industry and academic communities because this enables accelerated implementation of new technology in industry practice and innovation. So we think, and we have practiced that, this is the way of giving the chance to people to help assist the company, and finally, since a company is progress progressing, then you have a good results for the society and for the country. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Gervainilidis. Uh, now we'd like to give the floor to Mr. Kardzis from uh, Hellenic Petroleum for his remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hello from uh, Hellenic Petroleum one of the major energy groups in uh, southeastern Europe and the major industrial group in Greece that we are using, we are utilizing technology, innovation in order to make investments in the future. And I would like just to give you a picture of what we are doing. If you go outside, you will see that, and you drive to go to your home, to your hotel, everywhere, two out of the three cars in this country are using fuels from our refineries. And at least one out of three cars is using fuel from one of our petrol stations. Electricity, part of the electricity here is from our power plants or our uh, renewables our uh, wind parks or photovoltaics. And of course, a great part of the gas in this country uh, belongs uh, also to Hellenic Petroleum. And with this, I would like just to enhance that innovation and uh, investments are going to form the future. And how we are doing it is going the next step. Until today, we had a traditional approach. We used crude oil and we produced some fuel, some liquid fuels out of this. Today, and the years that are coming, we are going to use this X, meaning X whatever, to L, to liquid processes. And this would be biomass, making biofuels, or biomass into liquids, gas to make gas to liquids, coal to you make coal to liquids, or whatever is available for is available for this. And please take notice that we have a very, very difficult environment because of various barriers that are technology barriers, that are legislation barriers or regulation barriers, plus the customer's attitude towards to what we are doing. Our customers are looking for more environmental friendly products. And all this going to the last bullet, which is profitability maintenance in order to survive. And how we are going to do this, the petroleum company, the energy company, the gas company, invest in renewables invest in renewable energy sources, 
produce electricity, produced biofuels. This is a nice picture of our wind farm. I, have, uh, I don't have some from our photovoltaics and other things, but looking ahead, we have to face the electrification of transportation. Looking ahead, we have to face this environmental friendly with low carbon footprint fuels. We are supporting new technologies and we are investing in everything that deals with energy and transportation. We are making diesel out of used cooking oils. And uh, we are doing research on this and we are improving uh, the findings we have and we are going to next step to uh, next uh, plants, pilot plants, in order to have uh, some really good uh, uh, results. We are making biofuels, next generation biofuels from algae. We are making uh, uh, also some byproducts out of this. We have some electric vehicle charging points in our petrol station and soon in some other places. And of course, in order to enhance our youth's dreams, our uh, brilliant minds of our students to make uh, their dreams reality, we are thinking out of a venture capital to invest in these nice ideas in energy and transportation. This is some nice pictures of, uh, as I told you, some of our projects. I will skip this, plus our European uh, initiatives, and conclude with this slide, saying that we have a vision, and our vision is sustainable transport and clean energy. We provide services, we provide products, we provide fuels, and energy and transportation. We are investing on this low carbon energy. We are investing in our relationship with academia. We are enhancing R&D in this area in order to evolve to an innovative, reliable, and competitive energy supplier of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karzis. Now, I think, yes, Mrs. Mariana Rally. So, good afternoon. I'm Mariana Rally. I'm Scientific Affairs Manager for Cores. For those who don't know us, it means you didn't get a goodie bag last night, so I'm very sorry for that. Um, we are a cosmetics company that was founded about 20 years ago by George Cores. George Cores is a pharmacist, and he started for a very small pharmacy based in the heart of Athens. He was very interested in what uh, chemicals are hiding in plants and what these chemicals can do for the well-being of humans and for our skin. And so that's how it all started in 1996. Today, the company sells globally. We distribute in 30 countries. We have 18 stores um, in cities like uh, Paris, Madrid, Singapore, etc. And in uh, Greece, we distribute products uh, in pharmacies, having, um, let's say, a point of sales in over 6,500 pharmacies. Also, we have a manufacturing site based about 50 kilometers outside of Athens. I have a few pretty pictures to show you. And an R&D team, which is a rarity nowadays in, uh, in Greece as a uh, uh, an exception to the, the big companies that you've just uh, heard from. And we still do invest in uh, R&D, which is um, a great thing for us scientists and for the company. So Cores, all in all, is considered a good company, a success story, and it's a very loved brand around Greece. The question now is, how do you continue being innovative and competitive in a global market? And how do you launch products into a difficult market where your um, competitors will also speak about your main competitive advantage, which is naturality? And how do you convince that R&D innovation from primary research is the way forward 
to develop products that consumers love, they understand, and they will buy and buy again. I'm going to attempt to answer these questions through an example of a launch we did last year uh, through the Castania Arcadia line. It's the chestnut tree. This is what the products look like. It's a face uh, line for uh, anti-wrinkle uh, care. Um, and it was launched in, 90, uh, sorry, in 2016, last year. However, the project started way earlier than that through a collaboration of an FP7, a European uh, Commission funded project called Agrocos. So Agrocos started in 2010 and was completed in 2014. The aim of the project was to find novel compounds with agrochemical, but for us mainly cosmetic industry. That was a, a, a top rated initiative. It was a real success to even get the funding because in some of the uh, presentations I uh, saw in the previous panel, we saw how difficult it is for Greek um, universities to get um, funding. However, that was one of the successful ones and the coordinator was the University of Athens. School of Pharmacy. We studied a huge number of natural ingredients coming from around the world. We wanted to check if these ingredients have a cosmetic action that we can capitalize on later on. We used plants that we collected from six global hotspots, hotspots of biodiversity, high biodiversity. So we wanted to find areas with large uh, numbers of endemic plant species um, and of course, there was a, um, a focus in EU uh, biodiversity uh, uh, hotspots. Here is a representation of the facts. Greece was one of, the, of these global biodiversity hotspots because it belongs in the Mediterranean basin, which is one of the uh, main global uh, hotspots for biodiversity. We collaborated with over 400 plants. It took four years of research 70 researchers working solely on this and hundreds of hours in the lab to reach findings that were interesting and worth publishing and worth using to launch products. We were very happy to see that the Greek origin plants had antioxidant activity and had a cosmetic interest. Amongst them was Castania arcadia, the chestnut tree coming from the south of Greece in uh, Arcadia. It was actually one of the top natural antioxidants in that panel. So 2014, Agrocos was completed. How do we reach 2016 to have a product on the um, pharmacy uh, shelves? Gores was the company, the first company that decided to incorporate the findings of Agrocos into, into the brand. What we found was that the chestnut um, extract had a high concentration in phenolic substances, the tannins and terpenoids like lupeol. And we found, interestingly enough, that this was specifically uh, prevalent in the leaves of the plant, which gave us a great thumbs up in terms of sustainability because we didn't need to cut trees or to interfere with the edible parts of the, of the tree. In 2015, we decided to look further and to understand what was a chemical that actually gave the antioxidant uh, action of this extract. And we found it was lupeol, a very well-known active in pharmaceuticals, but never uh, been used before in cosmetics. So um, this was the prime uh, uh, candidate of the action. So then we collaborated further with, com with companies who had expertise in order to help us to understand the mechani mechanism of action of lupeol. Furthermore, we wanted to understand how lupeol acts on a cellular level. So these are two um, extra research projects we retained, the University of Athens to understand um, how it affects the skin and uh, also the cell proliferation and, age, uh, and aging uh, laboratory based here in Democritus. We can say that the chestnut, the uh, Castania Arcadia line is a global innovation and we proved that it is a treatment against wrinkles. This is a strong claim in the beauty industry 
and this is the first time that we could move into categories of anti-aging with a strong claim. Our suspicions and our scientific findings were confirmed from the first panel test. Women were very happy with the product efficacy. It might seem um, like a, a lie that the companies use, but the reality was that you never get 100% happy consumers with your products. So this was a great result that we could use. Upon launch, the product in 2016 brought in more than 2 million euros in uh, Greece, and also significant share increase in the face category, the flagship category for all cosmetic companies. We even found out that we could uh, take consumers from the big multinational brands, which is a huge success for a small Greek brand. Also, the Agricos innovation gave us something to talk about to the press. So the science and beauty um, press were very happy to understand how we reached this conclusion. To sum up what I said today and maybe give some food for thought and for uh, talking later, I'd like to uh, show, demonstrate the importance of research and innovation and of not being scared to collaborate with academia, with farmers in our case or with uh, other industries in, uh, in, in other uh, cases, but also with other companies. I'd like to discuss the scientific support with, of academia to industry and vice versa, and the difficulties that we, we all find uh, in these um, collaborations. Also, I'd like to raise the importance of the advantage we give to marketing and communication through such innovations. In our case, this also brought a competitive advantage to, towards other companies that claim natural, and of course it strengthened our um, innovative profile. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Valli. And then I'm going to finish this round uh, with uh, Mrs. Papadimitriou. She represents the Federation of Hellenic Food Industry. Good afternoon. I would like, first of all, to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present today how sustainability and innovation can be tuned into significant opportunities for the food sector. Uh, the Hellenic food and drink industry is a leading industrial sector in Greece. It has uh, a significant importance for the Greek economy. Uh, the turnover is uh, 14.2 billion. It's the biggest employer uh, with uh, 3,600 employees directly and indirectly. And also the export reached the amount of uh, 4.0 billion despite the crisis. Also in the sector, more than 1,200 companies, small and medium size in their majority, are active. In Europe, the Food and Drink Federation is also significantly important for the European economy. It's the largest manufacturing sector with a turnover of 1 trillion euros. It's the leading employer with uh, more than 4.25 million employers. And also it has um, a positive trade balance of 25.2 uh, uh, billion. The Federation of Hellenic Food Industries, which I represent, represents the Greek um, food and drink industry at national, European, and international level. We have as members food and drink companies and also branch association. And the mission of the Federation is to create an environment uh, uh, which uh, is easy for the food and drink companies, whatever their size, and also can meet the needs of the consumer. In order to accomplish our mission, we have a lot of priorities. You see them here. And, uh, Two of our major priorities is innovation and sustainability. And that is why we believe that innovation, through innovation and sustainability, we force, we help the food sector and the manufacturers to remain uh, competitive. We all know that uh, in the fast changing world that we live, 
The food and drink sector uh, faces a lot of uh, challenges. One of the most important challenge is the food and nutrition security and is an urgent objective due to the increasingly interconnected challenges of natural resource scarcity, climate change, and also population growth. So in the fast changing world, world we live, we have to produce more with less and we need to satisfy the needs and the requirements of the consumer for healthy nutrition. In other words, we need to ensure that nutritious food and water are available, are accessible and are affordable for all. We also need to build uh, the food system in a way that they're adapted to climate change and conserving national resources and contributing to climate change mitigation. We also uh, need to implement the principles of the circular economy across the whole food system while reducing the environment footprint, which we have already heard from the other companies also as a priority and initiative. And also we need to boost, to promote, in other words, the innovation and investment while empowering communities. Uh, in the Federation of Hellenic Food Industries, uh, we believe that, uh, as I already told you, uh, sustainability and innovation are very important for the food sector. That's why I'm going to present uh, two um, case study, two successful case study, uh, the Footprint Project and the Controfelia Contest, which are connected to the Footprint Project with sustainability and the Controfelia Contest with innovation. The Footprint Project aims to implement um, measures in order to reduce, to identify and to quantify the carbon footprint in the food sector while on the other hand increases, help to increase the competitiveness, the competitiveness through the development of an innovative uh, software tool. How we create the cooperation model? We enhance uh, an existing funding program in which four companies, two universities and two federations, the Greek Food and Drink Federation and the Italian Food and Drink Federation, create a partnership under life uh, project and uh, the mission of uh, the, the, uh, the, the main uh, scope of this uh, partnership was to address a real need for the food industry and also to develop a solution for the sector. Uh, the roles of the partners are very different in the project. The universities are solution developers. The companies uh, provide the necessary data, test the solutions, and in any way they are the end users. And finally, the federations are responsible for the dissemination of the results, meaning that they help uh, to raise the awareness in the food and drink sector, and also they're responsible to develop proposals for the policy makers. Just a few words about the history. We all know that uh, till 2050, the world population will uh, reach uh, the nine billion, which means that we have 60% uh, increase in food supplies, 45% in uh, the demand for energy, in the need for energy, 30% uh, need for water for agriculture, and um, also we, need, we have need for, uh, we need more arable land. We face uh, unex unexpected and predictable weather conditions. And also we all know that um, the food that is uh, produced, that 30% of the food produced over, all over the world is wasted. So how can we face these problems? The only way is to change uh, the way we produce, the, the way we distribute, and the way we utilize food. And through our uh, attendance, through a footprint uh, project, we succeed to create uh, two solutions. The one is the footprint tool, which uh, qualifies the total CO2 uh, equivalent emission in food products taking into consideration all the processes involved in the food sector and for the, till the final product. And also the other solution is uh, the national strategy we have developed for the reduction of the CO2 emissions for the food industry, which will contribute also to the increase of the competitiveness of the sector. 
If we want to summarize the benefits of the footprint uh, project for the sector, is first of all that it helps the awareness of the food sector on environmental issues. Also, the tool helps the companies to improve their environmental performance, and more specifically, the, the companies that are also uh, that are already participated in the project have reoriented their environmental approach. And also, the network of food industry and academia and research association was expanded to this research field as well, and this is very important. I will say just a few words also for the Ecotrophelia contest, which is our way for the promotion, for the, to promote innovation in the food sector, one of the tools we use. Uh, the Ecotrophelia is a competition for students uh, which uh, takes place uh, in two different stages, at national level and at European level. At national level, the competition is organized every year by the initiative of the National Food Federation. In this contest, students' teams uh, take part with their supervisors and they present uh, products, initiative, innovative products that they are distinguished for their taste and also their friendly environment character. And also the food companies in the context of the competition help uh, the students' teams uh, on a voluntary basis. At European level, uh, the winners uh, of the national uh, contest uh, take part at uh, the European um, uh, competition, which every year takes place in the context of um, either Anunga or Sial, and this year will take place the European uh, uh, contest in uh, London uh, in the context of Food Matters exhibition. So what we succeed uh, through Ecotrophelia is uh, to use the imagination of the future uh, food scientists and to, to make them speak with the food industry and to conceive uh, the tomorrow's uh, food. The roles in the contest are totally different. Uh, so the federations are the organizers of the competitions and the students' teams are the developers of the innovation. And uh, if we want to see uh, and to summarize what we succeed through the, uh, in, through the organization of the Ecotrophelia, uh, I would like to mention that we organized the Ecotrophelia since 2011. The most important thing that we succeed is to bridge the gap between the industry, the academia, and the research providers. We also succeed to support the students engaged in food science, which will uh, work in the future in the food industry. <coughs> And also, we create a hotbed of innovative ideas for the food uh, industry. In other words, through the Ecotrophelia, a lot of uh, products, a, a hundred of products, have been produced and they have been manufactured and reached the market. And also, we have uh, succeeded to um, create a pool of talent, skills, and innovations for the food uh, industry. Thanks very much for your attention. Uh. Thank you. I think, uh, sorry, I think you, you had uh, a diverse a view of the diversity of the things that uh, uh, here uh, the local industry is working on. Uh, I would like to um, uh, start a discussion here with the panelists and ask the first round of questions, and then I can take some questions from the audience as well. So, I w I w by listening to all these activities, I would uh, really like to know, uh, since you are on the ground, what are the, the, the main obstacles that you face when you try to do efforts to spend a um, uh, significant amount of money on R&D and try to do innovation? What are the obstacles that you face in a country like Greece? Or uh, to this, in, the, in the same context, what are the, the advantages that you, that you uh, believe that they are, the local advantages um, uh, for doing research? Because it, Greece is not a country that the, the, the business sector in Greece is not famous for the uh, uh, level of R&D activity. So actually, those companies that they do invest in R&D are very significant. So I really would like to, to give to the audience the, some ideas of how things are uh, evolving. The floor is open. Is anyone would like to make a first comment? You? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. So. Um, I'd like to start with the positives. I think we all saw uh, one thing in common that we all have here, especially the producers, is we really evaluate, we really value Greece 
for what it offers us. Um, if I may say, Greece is a blessed land. It has very good minerals, it has very good soil, so companies such as ours can make the most of it and bring, bring you products, new products, products you can use, products with real value. In addition to that, Greece has uh, wonderful people. I'm sure you met them during the last days, and I can assure you that the quality and the level of scientists, of the students we get, is of the highest quality. And I'm sure you're coming from different backgrounds, from different places. I'm sure you all have a Greek colleague somewhere. And uh, I hope you can all say that you're proud of, the, of, that, of your Greek colleague. So that's, that's a positive. That's definitely a positive. We have good, let's say, materials, good assets to use. Uh, I'd like to go a bit on the negative side. Uh, typically, when you start something new, uh, you have to face reactions because we, by our trade, we are disruptive. We have to be disruptive. We have to think differently and we have to think ahead. And sometimes we have to make suggestions that don't sound so easy or not, are not accepted as easily as we would like to, we would like to have them. So uh, apart from that, which is common anywhere, I guess, in the world, here sometimes uh, we have difficulty when we collaborate with, let's say, uh, how to put it nicely, we have bureaucracy. This is also uh, one of our major products, I can say. So apart from that, uh, I wouldn't really say that there is any other major, let's say, uh, issue to face in R&D. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I give a very, you know, uh, I'm, I really, I can, I, can, I can only agree with what has been already mentioned, though the famous brain drain is a major obstacle. We can hardly find specialized people who come out even postdocs, even people who have done research in universities. And there is a reason behind that, which is an additional obstacle. Because universities in Greece are not following the trends of the industry. This is something that we're trying to, to, to bring them closer to what is actually needed in the industry. We have seen several times, and uh, I'm sure there might be some professors here around, uh, around this table or around in, the, in, the, in the audience. And uh, unfortunately, in Greece, we have seen research being done not as the industry wants to have. And also even that, the curriculums for the students sometimes are far away of what, of, of what is really needed in the industry. The result of that is that we can hardly find the people who fit for the purpose, and therefore sometimes, and fortunately, we can find Greek people who have studied abroad and have done more specialized studies and, uh, and bring them back to Greece for the good reasons that uh, uh, my colleague here has mentioned. So, and the other, the other obstacle that, I mean, main obstacle is that there is no strategy for research and development. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm talking about a sustainable uh, strategy of the, uh, of the governments throughout the years. And although we know that research and development is the backbone of the globally competitive and knowledge-driven economy, though not much attention has been um, given towards that in Greece. And um, finally, because this is mentioned sometimes, R&D funding. R&D funding in Greece is, in our view, made in, uh, not, in actually not the appropriate way. It, uh, it too much focuses on SMEs, though, I mean, maybe you, you may think that I'm biased because I'm representing a large corporation. However, we, we truly believe that large corporations, if they get the right incentives through funding, and I'm talking about not small funding addressed to, to SMEs, they will actually lead the way 
get the smaller companies together and so have a much better and much focused result. I also wanted to, to add a few things to what have just been heard because I completely agree. In terms of the collaboration of uh, companies with institutions, Am I being heard? Yes. yes. And the institutions, I think one of the problems is that often companies like ourselves don't know who to speak to. There are no innovation offices in major academy, academic um, centers and there are no innovation offices in uh, the major universities. This is a tool that we, have, we, we can see abroad groups of business people with scientific backgrounds who can really bring uh, the academics and their research into life with existing companies or with spin-off companies uh, through uh, funding. And in terms of uh, funding, as you very rightly said, um, there is a, a huge gap uh, in what is uh, defined as a large company. Cores is considered also a large company, although we are nowhere near the, the major multinationals that are considered um, uh, large. And of course, I agree that there should be more of a push to large companies because that's where the resources are already in place to bring innovation. Just to mention that for us also, uh, we have already, they have already been mentioned that uh, there is, it is very important as an obstacle the lack of cooperation between the industry and the academia and the universities and also the lack of flexibility from the universities and the research centers in order to meet the needs of the industry. And also, uh, as far as it concerns the financial issues, as I already told you, the majority of the industries, of the companies, of the food and drink companies are small and medium sized and there is a lack of financial resource, uh, not only within the company, and also, but also there is an inadequate public funding and the SMEs, the small and medium sized enterprises, they are not getting uh, enough funding in order to promote research and innovation and this is very important. Let me add also some comments, focusing uh, and exaggerating also in the lack of the link between industry and academia. Uh, we have a, a great academia which is totally theoretically in the vast majority. And when we people from industry need some solutions, we cannot find them. Believe me, you are looking for them, you cannot find them. I'm talking for Greek academia. If we talk for practice, we should talk for patents. Tell me which research project is based on patents, almost nothing. I'm full of papers, of nice research, of nice academic outputs, with almost zero impact on industry. This means that we have to refocus on this. Well, uh, there is also probably some issues about funding, but if you gain, if you spend money in a dream, in a vision, in what you have in mind, and this has uh, the proper investment output, then you earn a lot of money. Of course, there should be, the state should uh, uh, you know, spend some money on SMEs, spend some money on big industries, that's okay. But if we as companies believe on something and invest money on this, uh, then we get some fruitful, fruitful results. Also, uh, a major, let's say, tool for funding R&D are uh, Horizon uh, programs. But unfortunately, uh, as a country, uh, as leaders, at least for these uh, Horizon programs, the output is very, very poor, which means we have to refocus either not only on research, but also on the application of this research. It means we need funding. We need some venture capitals 
We need uh, some seed financing for startups. And this is that we all, industry, academia, and the state, uh, should uh, merge together and have the best output. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, from our side, if I may take the ICT part, let's say, I will agree with most of my colleagues here. I think the number one asset that we have in Greece is the skills, the skilled personnel, the skilled professionals. I mean, for example, we as Ericsson, we are outsourcing part of our R&D. We have 400 engineers here for the last 30 years or so, and they are doing excellent job. They are getting awards and prizes one after the other. They have one of the best development centers outside Ericsson. So the skills are there and the expertise are there. Also, I mean, in our company, which is a sales company, 40% of our engineers are running projects in other countries because they're really good at what they are doing. So the human capital is certainly an asset that we have in Greece. However, the, on, on the cons, the, the problems that we have is this uh, disconnection, complete disconnect between industry and academia. We are absorbing most of the EU funds for research, yet, nothing or almost nothing of this is being capitalized in terms of being commercialized and industrialized and being used in the industries. So there is a complete disconnection. And this is partly because of the culture and mentality, and this takes a long time to, to change, because there is some kind of demonization of entrepreneurship and industry if it gets in contact with the university and the academic community. And this is wrong. So this is one part, I think, that is wrong. The other thing that is wrong is that there is no cohesive national strategy because there is no vision. There is no vision about the country, where we want to go, who we want to be in five years from now, which are the top three or four strategic sectors that we want to excel. And then let's get together and really move together in research, in industry, and everywhere towards this direction. That would certainly help to put us into order and make miracles, but we lack that. May I just add that um, it is rather strange that there were efforts for years now to set up to build a technological platform that actually uh, would bridge the gap between the academia and the industry. And neither the, the, the governments nor any of the of the ministries, nor even, unfortunately, any other uh, entity has um, achieved that. And that's a great pity because I do share that the, the, um, the opinion that uh, we have skilled personnel, we have skilled people. However, what I mentioned before, not really always specialized for what is needed for the industry. Thank you, although I have to say that we strategic plans, we have seen a lot. The problem is on implementation, for, because we have seen a lot of uh, strategic plans in the country. I saw a question from the audience, yes, mister. Uh, there's a mic coming. Thank you, Ray Pikaplinski, University of Sussex. Uh, I was going to make two points, I'd like to make one and a half. Uh, the first point is as much to the audience as it is to the people on the stage. Greece's problems of competitiveness are not to be solved by firms of the sort that you have there. It's the long tail of enterprises who are not at the frontier. And innovation doesn't have to be new to the world. It may be new to the sector, and it may not be even new to the sub-region in the country. It may be new to the firm. So when we're thinking about innovation and Greece's productive sector rival, me the attention needs to be less at firms like yourselves who are already doing that, but to think about innovation and innovation challenge for that long tail of productive sector which is not represented here. The second half a point I was going to make, it was going to be a full point, but you've initiated the discussion. Uh, nominal wages we heard this morning fell by 18% over the last five or six years. This is a country with enormous human potential much of which is outside of the country, but we'd be willing to come back and eager to come back if the opportunity so arose. Uh, Korea had a program in the 1960s and 1970s to bring back Koreans from abroad. The Chinese had the Returning Turtles program, which was specific incentives for Chinese abroad to come back to China. 
and the firms which those returning Chinese were involved in were much more innovative than the firms which were started by Chinese who hadn't worked abroad. So my half point is really a challenge to you. You're all responding to the very excellent question from the chair as individual respondents. Yes, well, my company has this, my company has that. You've got a lot of muscle. Sit down together and don't think you also have responsibilities to society, not necessarily what's good for Titan individually, but what do we think our government should do in order to make Greece an attractive place for other companies to take advantage of Greece's human potential by relocating some of their innovative activities from perhaps an office in Rome or London, whatever it is, to Greece where wages are relatively low, where you have this high potential. Some collective action rather than individual responses seems to me some sort of social responsibility. Thank you. Is anyone wants to respond to this? Huh? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe a couple of more questions because we're running out of time. Thank you very much for the presentations. As the director of Democritos, uh, uh, let me all congratulate you and make a point about the, the industrial fellowship uh, program that just began last July. Two of the companies in the panel are already sponsoring fellowships at Democritos, four-year fellowships, uh, Titan and Hellenic Petroleum. Uh, 60 young uh, researchers, very gifted, they, they've started their term here and they're going to work for the next four years exactly on issues that uh, are problems and challenges for the companies, for the industry that is sponsoring them. This is, this is a program that was uh, uh, initiated by Democritus. We are seeing it through, and we are very proud for that. And, and we based a lot of, of this on the support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. This is a four million uh, euros donation, which has been augmented by another million and a half that comes from the support of the companies. So in, in, the sense, in that sense, we are going to learn a lot these four years, because this is research done here at Democritus, but it's exclusively oriented towards the problems you are setting, the industries that are supporting those. On the, on the, other, on the other part, I would also like to make a, a comment that uh, uh, we also have a, a few complaints as academic, academic places from the industry. When you approach us, uh, basically, uh, most of the times you are looking for, the, for access to infrastructure. It's not so much that you're listening to the ideas. Uh, especially if the ideas they don't may not be too relevant to what you are searching for. Uh, so this also, this attitude a little bit has to change. And, and the lack of innovation offices is indeed quite a, a problem here. But to have this created, I have created last month an innovation office at Democritus and it's going to, par to be part of our organization and I hope it will be a very successful office. But besides the goodwill and the big effort of the people involved, you need very well skilled people for technology transfer. And this we don't have yet in the country. We don't know how to negotiate technology transfer. We don't know how to negotiate licensing. We don't know how to negotiate equity. Uh, and of course, uh, in this front, you, the industries of this country can help, especially by attracting or creating uh, in, in, the, in, in the market, uh, you know, the, the human potential that will be capable of, of bringing this mentality that, that can bridge uh, the gap between us uh, even more. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, I would like to respond to the, uh, I'm sorry I did not get your name, but uh, I'd like to respond to what you said. The truth is, we do not have to innovate, and we shouldn't do it for innovation's sake. What we have to do is we have to be successful. We have to be the best we can. And in that, yes, we can do it by innovation. Uh, if I may take a bit of your time just to tell you a short story about Titan. Titan remains one of the successful companies in Greece, and it's been through some rough times. Back in the 90s, Titan was solely based in this region. And the, good, the times were very good back then. It was Olympic times, we were preparing for the Olympics. There was such a high demand of cement that, you know, at that time, everyone was saying, we're gonna be, if I may use the expression, made for life, okay? At that time, our management said, yes, it's a good time also to, if I may say, innovate. 
How did they innovate? Okay, they actually moved with geographical diversification. They moved to new locations. At that time, for them, it was something totally new. And I'm sure there were people saying, why do you need to go there? Why do you need to make this change? We have some men, there's like the demand is so high. But they were seeing ahead and they were willing to go outside their comfort zone. They had the plan and they moved with that plan. And <laughs> thank God it moved very well for us because thanks to those decisions made early, we were ready to handle the very rough crisis of, the, of these years that is actually pretty much going on. So for today, actually, we were called to present our examples uh, as, let's say, successful Greek companies, how we innovate generally and how that helps us be successful. I think uh, we can provide more feedback, all of us, more input on this. And believe me, it is essential that the Greek state also uh, participates in that. And I believe that this kind of conversation, this kind of discussions helps a lot because already uh, the, the, ex the opinions expressed just now, uh, I do believe they help towards bringing us closer together. I hope that uh, responds to your remark. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can also add as a response that we do work also collectively, actually. This is an excellent idea that you brought forward. Definitely, we have the National Federa Association Federation of Industries in Greece, and we are a very active member, as and many, and all of you, I think. And we are working a lot on uh, trying to bring forward ideas to the Greek state of how the state, what they should do, according to our opinion, and also ourselves, how can, they, can we help create the right environment for innovation and research in Greece? Um, yeah. And, oh. I, I would like to mention that for the food sector, and I think it's uh, understandable for all of you, uh, innovation is linked with competitiveness and extroversion. And that is why uh, through the Federation we have created uh, the Hellenic Technology Platform Food for Life uh, since uh, 2009 in the context of the European one, and the mission of the platform is uh, to promote the cooperation and the dialogue uh, between uh, the food industry, the universities, the academia, and the research association, and also uh, to find out uh, the priorities for the sector. So uh, through the, the technology platform, we have succeeded to, have a, to speak with the uh, universities to, to, to sit together and to discuss our common issue, uh, the, the priorities of the sector, the research priorities for the sector. And also we have, uh, we have created four um, uh, working uh, committees with different uh, thematic area. And uh, in, by this way, we try to find a common language, to create a common language and to discuss uh, and to, to promote the innovation for the benefit of the food sector and the competitiveness of the economy in Greece. Uh, thank you. Of course, if I may, you, you, you raised a good point. I mean, I mean, but these are the companies, you need these companies in a country like Greece because they act as answers, you know, and there is an ecosystem around these companies of suppliers, of uh, subcontractors, that they also get a feeling of the innovation. So you need these companies. If we didn't have these examples, as you said, yes, it's not representative of the whole business sector, but it is, it is I think, uh, companies that can, you know, drag the whole, the whole system. Uh, we did not respond to the, to the, to the accusation, let's, uh, no, to the blame of the, uh, yeah, not accusation. Yeah. Sorry, so, we need to respond. First, first of all, I'd like to say how glad I am to hear that you have uh, set up an innovation office in Democritos and we are excited, as uh, I'm sure my colleagues back in uh, Kores will be very excited to, to meet the people you have uh, uh, hired to do this very challenging job. And of course, uh, you will find, I think, that uh, we speak very different languages. However, all of us have been to university, so we know uh, what it's like to be in this environment. We have, uh, most of us have a PhD, so we know what it's like to to speak to, to, um, to an academic uh, audience. The difficulty is that once you move from academia into industry, the most important thing is to uh, make um, 
uh, every decision you decide to follow accountable to your uh, directors and to make sure that every decision you, you choose, whether it is R&D or any expense you decide for your um, R&D team, um, a cost-effective um, decision. So this, I think, you will uh, find uh, in, uh, in our discussions, in your discussions with industry, um, will uh, be the foremost point of, um, uh, and, and I know somebody, I don't remember who, one of the speakers said that budget shouldn't be uh, the, the most important thing, and I agree totally. Um, and usually, in order to m not make it a huge issue, budget, you need a long-term uh, collaboration. So I think this is a very optimistic uh, message that you gave us. Okay. I, will, I will have to challenge you because uh, I heard about this innovation office at Democritus just today. What was the challenge? Shouldn't we, as big players in the market, for whatever reason we are, know about that in advance. How do, you, how do you market that? Is anybody from your side coming to us just to tell us that it is there? Because this innovation office needs some ideas to start thinking, to start innovating. So that was not the case. We, OK. OK, OK, and, 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 and I give you another example, and, and another, I give you another example which is not, which is not for Democritus. Actually, do you think, do you think that as is done abroad, and actually we have a good experience from UK where we have some plants there, and we see professors coming to us asking, where is the trend? What do you think we can do for you? What is an interesting thesis? What is an interesting, what an interesting PhD that we can do for you so that we can work together, that we can share the expertise? This is not done in Greece, unfortunately. The research is going to be done here at Democritus, and it's going to serve exactly challenges and purposes of Titan and of Hellenic Petroleum. It's not our inspiration, it's the, the inspiration of the company and their PhDs, four-year PhD terms and four-year postdoctoral terms. So things have started. We are listening to your needs. But I also think, and this is something you have to pay attention, incremental innovation definitely is accountable to your managers. Disruptive innovation, for that, you have to listen to ideas, very fresh and new. Um, the discussion is very hot, but we have to finish, uh, actually. Yes, someone has to get the flight as well. And we'll have to close the, the, the seminar, please. Please, we have to, to close the... Just, just one remark from that, from a German perspective. I'm working for Fraunhofer, which is the Society for Applied Research in Germany, which is somehow in between basic research at the universities and, and, and research within the companies. Now, my experience from, from working in Fraunhofer is that necessarily there, there's a certain difference between research at the university level which is much more advanced, and research uh, uh, which is necessary for the companies. We also have to think, and that is our experience when we hire people, uh, that uh, the engineers from the universities, they need one, two years until they gain the experience, the understanding uh, that they can lead a small research project uh, uh, for the companies. And I think these, these differences uh, are, are bigger than, than we sometimes uh, imagine uh, uh, because what, what you need in the companies is, is, is much more specific uh, whereas what, what you need in academics is much more driven uh, by, by what is, is needed for a PhD. So I think uh, uh, there are only two solutions that is either uh, there, there is time for, for the graduates to slowly adapt uh, within the companies or there is some intermediate an organization that actually
puts these uh, 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 graduates out of university, uh, prepares them, and basically uh, transfers not only good ideas and ideas, uh, but also transfers then, then uh, human capital uh, towards your company. So, so I think thinking a little bit what the institutional setup could be that could provide uh, that link, I think uh, that would be a very important discussion also for Greece. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to thank everyone for being here and the discussion that short discussion that we had. And uh, just wait here. We're going to close the, officially close the, uh, the conference. So I would like to call where is, uh, Jan Scaloiro and Jose Casolato to close the conference. Stay tuned, don't leave. Huh? <laughs>